All right, well, welcome to um, part two of week 12, which I guess technically makes this week 13 of our prayer book class. And this is probably the last class that's in the, the Book of Common Prayer proper. But I do think I'd like to um, spend, spend a couple classes looking at the ordinal before we get into the, um, uh, the, 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 the catechism and kind of shift gears to being really the, uh, that prep for um, confirmations or receptions. Um, so, but for now, let's turn to page 332 and continue the burial service. Last week, if you recall, we looked at the, um, the funeral office itself. Today, we're going to look at the, the service at the grave, and we're also going to look at the, um, the communion propers for the burial service, uh, for, 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 a, for a, a, a burial communion, a requiem mass, as it, as it used to be called. Um, so yeah, we're beginning at page on page 332. And um, remember, one of the big questions that we're, we're looking at is, is related to the prayer book and implicit prayers for the dead. Um, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting thing that I had not noticed how prevalent it was in this service until preparing for this class. And if that makes you uncomfortable, yeah, me too. Uh, so <laughs> we'll talk about some of that as well. Okay, page 332 at the grave. So um, the, the way it's supposed to go is that we would do the funeral office at the church. Um, we have done it, of course, at funeral homes because they usually have little chapels and that sort of thing. Um, but then we would move to the grave site itself and conclude the service that way. Um, in my experience, most of the time, most of the way that's gone is um, at uh, Fort Sam. Um, we've done a lot of Fort Sam funerals at, in, in my time at All Saints um, because anybody that serves has has their has their uh, their spot there. Um, a lot of other folks, non-military folks, have tended to request cremation, which is. And we're going to talk about that as we get we get towards the end of this service. That's one of the reasons why we are going to be doing a columbarium um, at the church, uh, and we would do this service at the columbarium. We would move out of um, the chapel proper to the columbarium to do this service, but with a few changes. So, at the grave. So the rubric says, when they come to the grave, all the bodies made ready to be laid into the earth shall be sung or said, and then we have this first anthem. It goes, man that is born of a woman hath but a short time to live and is full of misery. He cometh up and is cut down like a flower. He fleeth as it were a shadow and never continueth in one stay. In the midst of life, we are in death of whom may we seek for succor, but of thee, O Lord, who for our sins are justly displeased. Yet, O Lord God, most holy, O Lord, most mighty, O holy and most merciful Savior, deliver us not into the bitter pains of eternal death. Thou knowest, Lord, the secrets of our hearts. Shut not thy merciful ears to our prayer, but spare us, Lord, most holy, O God, most mighty, O holy and merciful Savior. Thou most worthy judge eternal, suffer us not at our last hour for any pains of death to fall from thee. So this first anthem is, uh, is of medieval origin. It's taking um, some things from scripture, but um, the, the, the kind of funny thing is, I, I think this is another one of those like the funeral, well, like the wedding, the Book of Common Prayer's wedding office that, um, although not quite as to that extent, has just kind of entered kind of English speaking, you know, the, the way we just think about funerals. And um, it surprised me when I kind of did, did a little bit of cross-reference how it's actually not a collection of scripture quotes. <laughs> it's just something that we've heard so often, we assume it's scripture, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, this was actually composed by a Swiss monk in the Middle Ages and was very, very popular, especially in Germany or what's now Germany. Um, in the Sarum, which, is, which was the Salisbury, where we get a lot of our liturgy from in the, in the English tradition, the Sarum rite, it was there as well. It was used in the funeral offices, not at the grave, but in the offices in the Sarum rite. Um, we do have some musical settings for this. Martin Luther wrote a metrical version of this in German. Um, so this is, this is kind of the traditional opening anthem when we're at the grave. And you can see that it, it really talks about um, 
you know, that a certain amount of that dread of judgment, um, that, that deserving of, you know, how, how our time is short and it's a, it's a sinful time. And so we're, we're really throwing ourselves at the uh, mercy of the court, so to speak. So that's the first anthem. We have in the 1928, something brand new, which is a second optional anthem. And that's at the top of page 333. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. He that raised up Jesus from the dead will also quicken our mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in us. Wherefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. Thou shalt show me the path of life and thy presence is the fullness of joy. And at thy right hand, there is pleasure forevermore. So this is a collection of scriptures, but you can see how um, just a, a total opposite tone from that first anthem. You know, they're, they're, they, they both do speak truth, but they really are very different focuses. Um, and th this is kind of, this, this kind of is, you can almost symbolize this by that switch in the Western church from using black vestments at funerals to using white vestments, right? This first one is a very black vestment sort of um, anthem. The second one is a very white vestment sort of anthem. Um, but either one, either one is good. Um, I've used both of them. Um, I tend to kind of make a, a game time decision on that, uh, just kind of reading the crowd a little bit. So that's, those are the first two anthems. Uh, questions, comments on that before we uh, get into the, the commendation. Okay, pretty straightforward. If you do just pop in, it's all good. Um, then we have 333, middle of the page. The, uh, we are casting earth on the body. Um, and the minister says, unto almighty God, we commend the soul of our brother departed and we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, ensure and certain hope of the resurrection unto eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose coming and glorious majesty to judge the world, the earth and the sea shall give up their dead and the corruptible bodies of those who sleep in him shall be changed and made like unto his own glorious body, according to the mighty working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. So in terms of kind of the, the actions of it, um, you know, this is kind of a very traditional sort of gravesite deal where um, the coffin is now in the grave and those standing by are kind of taking a pan, panfuls of earth and symbolically putting it on, onto the coffin. Um, that's often not the way it works these days because we kind of have mechanisms to, to lower it in. And again, we, we've done at All Saints, most of ours at Fort Sam. And so they'll have the grave side, not actually at the grave, but at um, this uh, kind, of, kind of pavilions. And then they, then they will move the coffin to the grave itself later on. And they do things like clock clerks, like every 15 minutes they've got a new one going on. So um, we don't, we would never do the whole service there. It's just too long, but we do the at the grave there. Um, so that's what's going on at the time. But, but notice what's going on here. We're, we're entrusting the soul of the departed um, to the Lord. We're putting his body in the ground, um, returning him to whence he came, you know, at earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Um, but it's in hope of the resurrection. Uh, again, this is a very different concept than we would have had in paganism. Um, you know, in, in, in paganism, you escape your body, but with us, it's kind of like being entrusted back to the earth in waiting for the resurrection of the body, waiting for, um, for, for, for an actual resurrection, not just a spiritual one. Um, that's pretty neat. Uh, but th this is a, this is probably the part again in Christian funeral rites that we're most um, kind of on a popular level. We think of the um, you know earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust sort of thing. So um, again, this is a, a a canto of scriptures, and it has been revised over and over throughout the centuries. Um, we do have a different version of this. If you flip a couple pages on page 337, which is the commendation if you're bearing them at sea. So we'll read that real quick. 
And that says unto almighty God, we commend the soul of our brother departed and we commit his body to the deep ensure in certain hope of the resurrection unto eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ at whose coming in glorious majesty to judge the world, the sea shall give up her dead and the corruptible bodies of those who sleep in him shall be changed and be made un like unto his glorious body, according to the majesty working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Um, I, I think burial at sea was kind of the poor man's burial oftentimes um, in, in, in times past, in, especially in England, um, being a very seafaring nation and probably parts of America, that was the case too. Um, cremation was not really a thing for most of most of the church's history. It is now, and there's a few reasons for that. But um, before we get into that, questions, comments on the two commendations as written here, and then we'll talk about cremation a little bit. Okay. Well, let's talk. Let's talk cremation first of all. What we would do. Um, a lot of the practices that, that happen regarding cremation aren't really the best thing in terms of um, consistency with, with our theology of, of the resurrection, our, our theology of death, um, you know, all, all of that. And e even in a lot of Christian circles, it's not really the, the best way to do things. The right way to do, do cremation in a Christian context is to inter the remains one way or the other. I mean, that's, that's, that's the best way to do it. Um, so why would we do cremation and why has it been historically not really much of a thing in the church? Um, well, in terms of why it hasn't really been much of a thing, there's two, there's two reasons. One reason is there was a theological fear that destroying the remains um, is somehow denying the resurrection. It's, it's, again, reinforcing that very pagan idea of escaping from your body. Um, this is just a shell. Let's destroy it, that sort of thing. And obviously, the church would discourage that. Um, the other issue is that to, to, to burn a body down to ash takes a lot of fire a lot of, and a lot of fuel. So in, in um, the Holy Land, there's just not that much wood. I mean, people just don't, you don't, you don't burn in those, in those, in those capacities. Um, so definitely the Jews never would have done it and neither would have the early Christians. But there's also that theological issue because both for the Jews and for the Christians, the resurrection of the body is a big deal, unlike for the pagans. But why is it done a lot more today? Um, there's two real reasons why it's, it, it can be, and I think it's a good thing to do in some cases today. One is the expense. At least here in the States, um, unless the military is paying for your funeral, it is ridiculously expensive these days. I mean, it, it, is, it is amazingly expensive. Um, cremation is a whole lot cheaper, even if you're going to use the funeral homes, um, columbarium, or some other way of interring of, of, of burying the, uh, the ashes in the funeral plot, um, even then it's much, much less expensive. And a lot of folks just simply can't afford a regular burial. So that's one issue. The other issue is it's a lot harder to have a church cemetery these days. Um, some older churches might have them. It's, it's a common thing, especially in very old parish churches in Europe, but in America, especially anything that's, you know, less than 100 years old, you're not going to often find a church graveyard. Um, it's long been the tradition within the church to, to, to bury people on holy ground at the church property. Um, that's part of that community of the saints. We are going by our ancestors, um, our fathers, the people that have been members here before us, even as we're going to church. That's part of that that, that ongoing witness of this is not just a thing going on right now, but this is something that has gone back. You know, this is part of, part of who we are as, a, as an extended family. Um, it's a lot easier to get columbariums uh, than it is to get a graveyard at a church these days. Most of the larger mainline parishes, uh, so, you know, Episcopalians, 
uh, Presbyterians, Lutherans, any of those folks will have here, here, here in San Antonio anyway, any of the larger ones will have a columbarium on site for that very reason. Uh, apparently All Saints has tried in the past and just never got the money for it. Um, we, the vestry did make a decision that we would put that into next year's budget. So, you know, unless there's a terrible loss of, you know, most of our budget for some reason in the next few months, um, we do plan on, on having one installed and local zoning makes that a lot easier. Um, th there's not really a lot of hoops for a church to jump through to do that. So, um, but we would change the wording of the commendation a little bit. So um, what we would typically say, you know, going back again to that commendation on page 333, unto almighty God, we commit the soul of our brother departed. We commit his ashes to the ground. Even if it's a columbarium, it's being committed to the ground. Um, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, et cetera, et cetera. So um, th that, is, that is something that, that can be done um, that is something that's often done a lot more today. And, um, but I think the important thing is that we, we ought to do this in a way that is theologically consistent with the resurrection of the body and treating the remains, treating the body with dignity. Um, and and, and if, you've, if you've done any of these types of things with, with loved ones, don't feel bad about it because you know this is one of those things that everybody does and just doesn't really think about it. But it's really not the most respectful thing to scatter somebody's ashes, right? Um, to keep their ashes on the mantle. Um, it really ought to be returned to the ground. Um, and a lot, a lot of times the symbolism of those things just really isn't the best symbolism anyway. You know, why do kind of in a secular mind, they scatter the ashes to the wind. Well, we're returning you to the universe, you know, kind of stuff, right? Now, that's not the way Christians tend to think, but that's where we're getting that from, from that kind of mindset. So yeah, that's not a good mindset to have. Um, you know, similarly, you know, kind of keeping, keeping it on the mantle, you know, you know, grandma's always with us, watching us from her spot on the mantle. Well, that's not the way it is either, right? You know, those, those, things, those things aren't the best way to do it. Um, and again, it's, it's best to inter, inter the remains um, and preferably on holy ground. Um, so that's that's that. Um, questions, comments on that? I, I, I will assume there's folks might have something to say about that just because of the way cremation is often done around in, in our parts. Go ahead, Delaney. So is there a list somewhere about how it is okay? Because I know there's a, not like just cremation, but how to bury people in general. Because I know there's a lot of ways to do that. Like mom's really against giving herself to science and stuff like that. Um, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the bottom line is that the, the, the Christian tradition really, really wants the body to be buried you know, the remains to be buried. And when we're burying cremains, it's more kind of speeding up that decomposition process. You know, we, 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 we don't mummify the way that the Egyptians do, even though there's a lot of embalming that goes into the way it's done a lot of times today. Um, you can make an argument against some of that, but really the bottom line is, yeah, it, it ought to be buried, whether it's actually in the ground or in a mausoleum, um, columbarium, something like that is the way it, it ought, it ought to be, um, from, from a, from a traditional Christian perspective. And, and the big thing we, again, we do want to avoid is thinking of the body as something we are escaping. Okay. I'm going on to my true self, my spiritual self, you know, getting out of this prison of the body. No, that's not a, that's not the Christian way to think about the body. Um, so that's, that's really the bottom line. Um, and most of the time when I've encountered folks who do either want to donate their body or be scattered like that, or they just don't care, it's because they're not really thinking in terms of a Christian concept of the resurrection. And they're not really thinking in terms of the dignity of the human body. Those are really the two things to keep in mind 
the idea, uh, you know, the our understanding of the resurrection and and the dignity of the of the human body. Um, it's not just a thing because we're dead, right? It's still it's still it's still human, right? We haven't lost our humanity because it's because it's dead. And 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 again, there's there's a lot of misunderstanding. So this is not to condemn folks at all, but 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 this is something we ought to be informed about. We ought to think about. Uh, Chris. Yes, uh, I just had a quick question. I don't know if you can hear me. This, this thing's not always good for the microphone. But uh, I, I was just had a quick question. Um, so the way I understand it is we kind of see things as, whereas like a lot of the pagans and the uh, and new agey type people believe the soul and the body are completely separate from one another and you're just like a, like a possessor of the body and you just control it as the soul. Whereas I think, we as Christians see it as they're kind of one and the same thing to some degree, like the soul and the right. body are in one package and that you're human, even though, yes, uh, we were resurrected l later, there's still kind of that package element. That same body is going to be the thing resurrected. It may be made perfect, but it's still the same body, essentially. Right. Yeah. Even that's And that's why or damaged or whatever. You know? Exactly. So. And that, that's why going to, you know, simply going to heaven when you die is not the end of the story. Um, you know, the, the souls in heaven awaiting the resurrection, um, they're awaiting the resurrection because it's not, that's not the end of the story. It's not, that's, that's not the, you know, souls ought to have a body. That's what they're made for. Right. And, and yeah, it, how that body is going to be in the resurrection, we don't fully know. We certainly know that, um, you know, the Lord has no problem putting it back together <laughs> and perfecting it. I mean, you know, it's, it's not, there, there was a, there was kind of a superstitious fear among some folk, both, both Jewish and Christian in, in, in times past, that if the body was destroyed through cremation, then, then, you know, you wouldn't be able to be resurrected because what, you know, what's, what's left to resurrect? Well, what's left if you turn I, it to dust? I, I have family members who still believe that. So yeah. I, definitely know people who are like no you you're, you won't be saved you're just gone if you get cremated like that's i think they're pentecostals but yeah yeah so yeah you 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 do run across that um that's that's you know it's an understandable mis misunderstanding but but it is a misunderstanding um but equally bad is that idea that you know the body just doesn't matter you know and, and it's not like if you, you know, are scattered or, you know, you're donated to science that the Lord isn't going to resurrect. It's not like that either. It's just, it's not the best way to do things, you know, and, and, and yeah, I, I think that's, that's probably the way, but, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Chris. Um, there, it's not, I'm a soul who happened to have this meat suit that I'm, that I'm controlling for a time being. That's, that's not the Christian concept. That's a very pagan concept. The Christian concept is I'm a single being. <laughs> yeah, Chris. I have one more thing based on that and it kind of came up as you were saying it. So that's why I was like being all hand raising and kind of obnoxious because I was like, I have to say that. But, <laughs> <It's all good. laughs> um, um, the, what I, my question is, is kind of um, that we're not a meat suit and that um, because of that, it's not really the desecration of the person is not really the fault of the person who's dead. Like the desecration right. of their body doesn't really hurt the person who's dead. It's really the people performing the act of desecrating said body, you know, whatever they're doing to said body to desecrate it. It's really, I don't know. I'm not going to try to say sin or what, what we're maybe some, some, in some ways you could consider it sin, but I don't know the exact boundary lines of that. So I'm not going to make any sort of judgment like that. I'm just saying it. it's, it's, it hurts them, not the person being desecrated, because they can't do anything anyways. I mean, they're, they're dead. And yeah, I, I think you're right about that. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think certainly some people in kind of their, you know, when they were expressing their wishes about what they want to be done with, um, with their body can be making mistakes, or even, you know, if it's intentional, it could be sin. I, you know, I, I think most of the time, this is more done out of ignorance um, than anything else. And, and that's, you know, the, the Lord has grace. Um, but we, we, we want to not be ignorant. Uh, Aspen, I see, I see your hand. How does that work with organ donation? Um, 
gosh, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't have a theology of organ donation. <laughs> I um, and and I would I would think that that's probably. I mean, just my gut tells me that that's a that's a better issue because it is this idea of using what I have and I can't use anymore to help somebody else. I, th I think there's there's some good to that. I mean, I know there are some Christian groups that have had major problems with organ donation because of that. And some of these Christian groups are only kind of quasi-Christian groups, you know, folks like Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, I, I don't think we need to be, you know, have, have kind of weird beliefs like that. Um, you know, again, some of that superstition. Um, and, and I do, th I, I think, you know, that's, my gut tells me there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I, I guess that's the best way to say it, which, which isn't a real answer. I, I, I just don't really have a theology of organ donation. So, okay. I think we are ready to, to, to move on from there. Um, let's look at the next part, bottom of two, uh, 333. Um, this is, the, this is what's often called the final anthem or the second anthem. And this is a quote from Revelation that says, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, write from henceforth, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Even so saith the spirit for they rest from their labors. And that really encompasses our theology of death more than anything else. You know, we are at rest from our labors awaiting the resurrection. Okay, so then we have some final prayers after the typical salutation. The Lord be with you with thy spirit. Then we have some final, you know, in the Kyrie's. Then we have some final prayers. We have the Lord's Prayer, of course. And then on 334, um, you have a choice of, what is this? One, two, three, four, or yeah, four prayers, th three prayers. So this first one is based on the medieval colic for the Requiem Mass. And it goes like this. O God, whose mercies cannot be numbered, accept our prayers on behalf of the soul of thy servant departed, and grant him entrance into the land of light and joy in the fellowship of thy saints through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Again, we have some of that praying for the dead stuff, right? Um, this is a very medieval prayer. The next one is a revision of the medieval collect that frames it much differently. And this is... Um, I think this is a Reformation era, but I could be wrong. I don't remember off the top of my head. Almighty God, with whom do live the spirits of those who depart hence in the Lord, and with whom the souls of the faithful, after they are delivered from the burden of the flesh, are in joy and felicity, we give thee hearty thanks for the good example of all those thy servants who, having finished their course in faith, do now rest from their labors. And we beseech thee that we, with all those who are departed in the true faith of thy holy name, may have our perfect consummation and bliss, both in body and soul, in thy eternal and everlasting glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So this, this initial language of um, burden of the flesh might lead you to say, okay, wait a minute, are we, are we having this escape thing again? But notice at the end it says, um, talks about our perfect consummation and bliss, both in body and soul. We are affirming the bodily resurrection, but there is a sense that in our fallen flesh, there is kind of a burden here. You know, we, we have temptations, we have illnesses, we have sickness, um, we have aches and pains. Um, and the dying and going to heaven is the first step in, the, in that resurrection, right? So, um, you know, yeah, so, so that, that's, that's there. And it was a revision of a medieval collect and mainly the revisions were focusing on Thanksgiving rather than on praying on behalf of those that went. And then we have this third collect, which was in the first prayer book from 1549, the collect for the Requiem Mass. It went like this, O merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, and whom whosoever believeth shall live, though he die, and whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall not die eternally, who also hath taught us by his holy apostle St. Paul not to be sorry as men without hope for those who sleep in him. We humbly beseech thee, O Father, to raise us from, from the death of sin unto the life of righteousness, that when we shall depart this life, we may rest in him, and that at the general resurrection in the last day, we may be found acceptable in my sight and receive that blessing, which thy well-beloved son shall then pronounce unto all who love and fear thee, saying, Come, ye blessed children of my father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. Grant this, we beseech thee, O merciful Father, through Jesus Christ, our mediator and redeemer. 
Amen. This is my favorite of the three. Um, it's a lot more wordy, but it but it says a whole lot. Um, and it kind of sums up just about everything we've been talking about in in the uh, in the in the service. And then we have this final blessing. And notice who this blessing is for. It's not for the person departed. It's for those who are still here. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great Shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And that really does drive home that the gist of this is not so much for the person that is gone, some of these kind of holdovers from the medieval prayers notwithstanding. Um, it's really for, for those of us still here, right? Um, it's to comfort us, it's to remind us of what's going on on, on a deeper scriptural, spiritual level um, and to um, spur us on to, to, to live lives as saints, right? Um, Thoughts, thoughts, questions, comments on those. Okay, we do have some final optional prayers on 335 and 336. Um, I'm not going to go through them, but basically those prayers um, focus on the union of the church militant and the church triumphant, that communion of the saints idea. Um, these are very kind of patristic in their focus. It focus. This is the way the early church tended to do things. Um, they come from various sources. I believe most of them were, though they have older antecedents, they, they were kind of new for the 28. Um, so that's, that's the burial service. We already talked about the burial of the dead at sea, that commendation. Let's turn briefly to look at the, the, um, the propers for a requiem mass, page 268. These are the collect epistle and gospel for um, a, a communion at the burial of the dead. So you'll see that in the 28, we have restored this idea of communion, the office, and then the, then the, the burial proper itself. So we have two options for the collect. The first collect goes, again, this is 268. O eternal Lord God, who holdest all souls in life, vouchsafe we beseech thee to thy whole church in paradise and on earth, by light and by peace, and grant that we, following the good examples of those who have served thee here and now at rest, may at the last enter with them into thine unending joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So again, we have this example of the saints, and we have this union of the church militant, the church triumphant. This very much echoes our All Saints Day call it. It has very similar themes to it. Then we have the, uh, the other side, which, which is um, gonna be very kind of medieval in its focus. O God, whose mercies cannot be numbered, accept our prayers on behalf of the soul of thy servant departed and grant him an entrance into the land of light and joy in the fellowship of thy saints through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. So yeah, again, there's that praying for the dead. Um, yeah, I, I would almost certainly always use the first call, like never the second at All Saints um, for, for, I think, obvious reasons. Our epistle reading is, is 1 Thessalonians 4, which um, really talks about that hope of the resurrection, talks about the change of our, of our bodies um, at the resurrection of the dead, um, that change from this mortal um, fallen body to a, to a glorified body. Um, and it's the passage that often you'll get quoted when folks are talking about the rapture, um, where it says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. When you read that in context, the idea of this kind of pre-trib taking the church away before, you know, before throwing, throwing the world into kind of hell on earth, that does not fit the context of First Thessalonians at all. I mean, this is really talking about the resurrection of the dead. Um, it, it has nothing to do with the kind of thing you see in Left Behind. That's a very recent idea um, one that is, if you find it in Anglican circles, it's very much a minority. Um, and we don't need to go into details on that here, but 
just note what's the context of that rapture passage. It's the return of the Lord and the resurrection of the dead. So um, yeah, that's, that's that. Um, and then we have for our gospel reading, John 6, um, all that the Father giveth unto me, or giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Um, this assurance of our election, the assurance of um, the Lord's goodness. And really, it almost makes no sense at all to have that second collect, that very medieval collect, with John chapter 6. Like the, like the theology of John 6 does not match um, what we see in that second collect. So um, I'm sure there are folks that would, that would argue that with me, but that's kind of how I see it. Um, you know, as we said last week, there is a very human impulse to, to, to pray for the dead um, in some way. And, and I think kind of the way it goes in our communion liturgy, you know, praying for that increase, increasing, you know, while, while they're before the Lord makes sense. You know, that C.S. Lewis last battle further up and further in sort of thing. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, this, you know, dear Lord, please accept the soul of our brother departed. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I mean, at this point, it seems a little late for that prayer, unless you're going to have a theology of purgatory. And, um, you know, in our articles, we explicitly don't. <laughs> I mean, we explicitly repudiate purgatory. So that that's that. And the, the one other thing, um, I guess let's, let's, let's stop, pause for questions and comments before kind of putting a, tying this up with a bow with, with one final discussion. Okay, um, th so the final thing, and this would have been a lot more appropriate last week when we were still in the octave of all saints, uh, but in the medieval church, um, you're, you're, you may or may not be aware, uh, we really had kind of a two and a half day season, mini season with, within, the, con within the, the, the octave of all saints. So it kind of begins with Halloween, um, All Hallows' Eve, um, and you, you see at least developing at some point kind of a, 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 a mockery of, of the devil on that day. That seems to be a, a much more later understanding than it would have been in the medieval church. Um, but you do start All Saints Day on the eve. Then you have All Saints Day itself when you're celebrating the saints in heaven. And then they had All Souls Day where you would commemorate the faithful departed. On All Souls Day, the vesting was in black. It was very somber. And really the focus in the medieval church was praying for the souls in purgatory. Because again, that concept of purgatory is that it's not for those that will be damned. It's those that will ultimately be redeemed, but they have to be purged of whatever's going on. They have to be have, have suffer the temporal punishment for their sins somehow once you're past the temporal land doing that, that, that never made a lot of sense to me um, prior to getting to heaven. The reformers took out All Saints Day for, oh, I'm sorry, All Souls Day for a really good reason. You know, the, the focus of All Souls Day was just not, um, it, it was not consistent with their understanding of the gospel. A lot of Anglicans have this desire to put it back. And sometimes it's in kind of a, a tamed down form rather than All Souls Day. It's, you know, the day when we remember the faithful departed, you know, almost making this distinction between the saints and the faithful departed. Um, again, our reformers would have been aghast at that idea because if you're a faithful departed, you are a saint. You know, that, that's, the way, that's the way that, that, that the reformers saw it. Why? because the saints are those who belong to the Lord, right? And that includes though, the, both the church militant and the church triumphant. And so to have a day, to have another day just kind of encourages, even if you're going to repudiate purgatory, it encourages coming to some sort of purgatorial conclusion. Um, and, you know, even in our Anglican circles, 
most of the time, the folks that want to have all, all Souls Day celebrations are bringing out those black vestments. Sometimes what they'll say is, well, All Souls Day is a day when we, were, when we mourn our loved ones who have died. Okay, that's fine. But that's not the message that, that you're getting across. The message you're getting across is we have saints and then we have everybody else. When the biblical picture is that, that, that we're all saints um, and, and that we will have our perfection when we're before the Lord. So um, I think there was a lot of wisdom in the way that the reformers did it, especially with that idea that there is a union between the church triumphant and the church militant, those here and now and those who've gone before, this great communion of the saints of all the elect as our collect for all saints day says. Um, so that's just kind of the final thing I wanted to say. And again, it would have made a lot more sense uh, seasonally last week when we were still in the octave of all saints, but, uh, but it's good to say now too. All right, any, any, any final questions and comments? Uh, anything you all want to say about any of this stuff um, over the last two weeks? Uh, Father, would you have time for a question? Sure. Um, Paul talked about it's kind of a purgatory, uh, not of souls, but of works, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, there's a fire and there's judgment and things are burnt up and everything's purified. To, that's not what you're talking about for purgatory, right? You're talking about a place or Right. So that's kind of, in Roman Catholic circles, that tends to be the go-to passage to defend the medieval doctrine of purgatory. But, but, but yeah, in, in context, that really does seem that it's, um, it's an issue not so much of um, me being purified as much as there are some things I'm going to be able to present to the Lord um, is okay, here, here, here are the good things you have done that I'm going to lay at your feet. These are the things that aren't so good, <laughs> that they're not going to last. And, um, you know, and, and, I, and I think if we, if we can talk about any sense of purgation, it seems to me that the very, just from, from, from scripture, and I think, again, Definitely our reformers would agree with me on this. And, and, and the, the, the death itself is that purgation. Um, you know, Paul, Paul likens it to, to waking up out of a dream. And I don't know if any of y'all have ever had um, some crazy, you know, dream where everything totally makes sense when you're asleep. And when you wake up, you're like, that was the dumbest thing ever. That, there are so many ridiculous contradictions. You know, the physics didn't work. And, you know, wait a minute. I, I, you know, I, I didn't even look the same at the beginning of that dream as at the end of the dream. You know, that, we've all had that kind of experience. And um, it seems that that's the way our sins and our faults and those things that seem so much a part of us even though we know that they're ungodly now, are going to be um, once once we die, you know that will be purified, that will be changed. I'll look at that pet sin and be like, "Gosh, how could that have ever ensnared me? That's so silly." You know, it makes no sense whatsoever. Um, and I, I think that's I think that's more the way it's going to be. Where it, for 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 Roman Catholic doctrine their understanding is, their assumption is that a switch like that would be too damaging to a person. That those sins are too much a part of me that they have to be purified through a process. Because if the Lord just took them away, he'd rip me away too. I think that's given the Lord a little too, li too little credit. You know, and, and I may be I may be explaining that in a very crass way that I'm sure any any savvy Roman theologians listening to this would be throwing things at their screen right now. I'm I'm, I'm sure I'm totally strawmanning that, but but that's the way when it's been explained to me. It seems to me, you know, from from 
Roman Catholic apologists. And, and I, yeah, I just think that's giving way to that's, that's short selling the Lord's grace and the Lord's goodness um, a little bit, but it's, it's putting a little bit too much focus on ourselves, which has been the complaint we've had with Roman Catholic theology for 500 years. You know, how, how can you tell, you know, and, and this is, I don't mean to be picking on our Roman Catholic friends because, you know, there's very good righteous people who, who are really concerned with their sin. But how can you tell when you've become legalistic? It's because you're focused on yourself. You're not looking at the Lord. You're looking at your, yourself and your performance all the time. Um, C.S. Lewis said in, in Mere Christianity, I think this was just as a wonderful quote. I, he might have been quoting somebody else. But I, that's where I heard it first. He said, okay, humility is not thinking less of myself. It's thinking about myself less. And, and, I, and so I, I, think, I think there's something to that. Uh, any, anyone else? All right. Well, then I'm going to go ahead and end the video here. And God bless you all. Thank you for joining us on week 13 or 12 part two, whichever you want to call it.